Well, we have a space problem this week, but after this sermon, it won't be a problem next week. I can hardly think of a more unpopular passage of Scripture. Uh, if it's your first time, it's, uh, it's great to meet you guys. Uh, we are just going through the book of Romans. If you're curious why we would uh, uh, deal with this passage, uh, we're making our way through the book of Romans, and uh, this is where we're at this morning, Romans chapter 13 about submitting to the governing authorities. I prayed all week that Jesus would come back before Sunday, and it, it, he didn't come. So I better give it a go. Let's pray together and ask for the Lord's help. And Father, I thank you for the spirit that's in this room, for the bond we have in Christ. And I pray that um, politics would never be a divisive issue for us. We would find our unity and harmony in the Lord Jesus. And as we uh, consider these matters, which can be um, touchy matters and matters of contention. Pray you give us the right kind of heart to listen. Pray you would unite us um, by the power of the Spirit. Pray that you would teach us. Um, and pray if there's sin in our life, we would repent. And we pray for leaders. If there's sin in their life, they would repent. And we pray that you would make us all learners and make us an honorable people. Most of all, help us to see in this text that we need a better king, and we have one. And so may we live life in light of that reality. And so, Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. What we are not, please make us. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. So Romans 13, 1 to 7, if you've got a Bible and you want to turn it on your device or open it uh, in, in your Bible, the point of this text is really clear. The, the, the problem is not clarity in Romans 13. The problem is what we do with it. The point is that we are to submit to governing authorities. This sounds really exciting, doesn't it? How many of you woke up this morning and said, I'd like some eggs, bacon, and a sermon on the civil authorities? <laughs> yeah. Kimberly and I went to D.C. this week. It was her birthday. She grew up in the D.C. area. And uh, we found all kinds of illustrations about how people don't like those in leadership, only I can't share any of them publicly uh, in a sermon. But not only do some people hate the idea of submitting to the governing authorities, bucking the authorities in our culture is even viewed as a virtue. And we need to ask the question, why? Why, why is submission and why is civil obedience, respecting officials, so difficult, so disliked? Well, to, for starters, we are sons and daughters of Adam. And rebelling against authority is as old as the garden. We want to do our own thing. That's not just a Texas thing. That's a human nature thing. We're all Texans, as it were. We don't even want God to tell us what to do. Who said? God said. Did God really say, the serpent says? So we, by nature, rebel against authority. But even more than that, I think this text strikes us, who are Americans, which is the majority of the room, not the whole room, this text is a little bit difficult because at one level, we came into being by rebelling against authority. Just ask our British friends. We don't want your king. We don't want your tea. We want to do our own thing. Don't tread on me. That's part of the American ethos, is it not? I always enjoy wishing my British friend Steve Timmons happy 4th of July every year. He always has a really witty comeback for me. And so because we came into being partly by rebelling, we tend to view rebelling against authority positively. Third, I think free speech tends to foster rebellion against authority. Free speech is a wonderful blessing. I benefit from it every Sunday as I preach. But some people take this freedom as a license to say whatever they want to say whenever they want to say it and speak about leaders in the most degrading way as if almost all of them are total buffoons and shouldn't be in leadership. Trashing authorities is a source of entertainment in our land. How many radio hosts make a living by doing it daily? Talk show hosts at night make a living by doing it nightly. You do realize that sort of thing doesn't happen in most countries. It would not have happened in Rome. You don't talk about Nero like that. And so while we have this freedom and we should enjoy it, we should also be careful with it and be honorable with it. But I think the reason why this, this text strikes us most troublingly is 
most of us in this room have had a bad experience with somebody in authority. Some of you may have even had a traumatic experience with perhaps parental authority, authority at school, a coach, a teacher, the police, some form of authority. And because of these experiences, we bring all of that to passages like this, and it's hard for us to take it in. So this is not a very popular passage for all of those reasons, and it's only intensified in the current political climate we find ourselves in. But we must remember that Paul was not writing in a perfect political climate. Nero was reigning. If you don't know much about Nero, he was crazy. He was more sane in his early part of his his reign, but later it got worse. He murdered his own mother, and she was the one who put him in office through her own little scheme. Paul knows who's in leadership. In fact, Nero, tradition tells us, will be the one who kills Paul. And Paul still writes what he writes here in Romans 13. So somehow we've got to take it in. This is God's word, and it's profitable, like all of God's word is, for shaping us into the image of Jesus. Now, a couple qualifiers. First of all, this text does not answer all of our questions about the government. We should not expect in seven verses to give you everything. (laughs) Paul is talking about general ideas about the purpose of government and our relationship to government. Perhaps a a better question is, why is Romans 13, 1 to 7 in Romans to begin with? I mean, if you're just reading through Romans for the first time, you're reading about sin and grace, the gospel and the cross, the resurrection. All of a sudden, you get to submitting to the government. You may wonder, what what is this doing here? Let me give you three reasons why it belongs here. Because some have said, this is added later, and I I don't buy it. To begin with, it continues the flow of thought from Romans 12, 17 to 21. That's the previous text. If you were here last week, um, we talked about uh, letting vengeance be God's and not trying to take matters into our own hands by personal retaliation. One of the reasons why we can leave vengeance to God on this earth is because he has instituted government to carry out that type of judgment. So it's really a continuation of what we studied. Last week, we also uh, talked about doing good, being peaceable. That's in Romans 12. So this, this is in the same flow of thought on how we are to live as faithful Christians in a pagan world. Another reason why I think Paul includes it is he's writing to people in Rome, the sim- center, the epicenter of the Roman world. You've got to say something at some point about the government if you're writing to Romans. And I think what he's trying to do is to help the Christians avoid two political extremes. I'll use some big words and I'll define them. One is an overrealized eschatology, which teaches the kingdom is here, so ignore Caesar, ignore Nero. Overrealized eschatology. And he's also trying to get them to avoid an underrealized eschatology, which is the kingdom is not here, so pick up a sword and let's go kill Caesar. Let's fight Caesar. Paul wants the Christians to avoid the ignore Caesar and fight Caesar option. He wants them to go a different way, a third way. This is what Michael Bird says. Paul might be saying something like this. Jesus is Lord, the new age has dawned, but be that as it may, we cannot get ahead of ourselves and live as if the authorities are not here. They are here and for good reasons. God has appointed them to provide justice for their peoples. What is more, some hotheads in Judea might be sharpening their swords for holy war, looking for opportunities to revolt, but that will not solve the problem. Instead, it will replace imperial rule with lawless anarchy. God can bring Rome to his knees, and he doesn't need your sword to do it. Yeah, Paul's not coming to Rome. By the way, he hasn't been there yet. He's coming, not as a political agitator, but as a missionary apostle. And that is clear. Now, he may have had something specific in mind. Tacitus, a historian, tells us that there was a growing discontentment with the government in the first century. Imagine that. And that there was a tax revolt in A.D. 58. Paul wrote Romans between 55 and 58. We're not sure exactly when. So regardless of the exact time when he wrote Romans, there seems to be a growing um, uh, discontentment with those in leadership, particularly on the issue of taxes. People don't like paying taxes. That's not a new thing. Now, the third reason why I think Paul includes Romans 13 in the letter is to clarify what it means to not be conformed to the world. He starts Romans 12 by saying that, doesn't he, in this new section of the letter? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
Christians for years have struggled with how do you live in this culture? Christ and culture. And so throughout history, Christians have adopted crazy views. And in Paul's letters, he has to clarify. At times, they said things like, you shouldn't have sex in marriage, that you should not be married, that you should reject certain foods, that you should overthrow the government, that you should not go to work because Jesus is coming back tomorrow. And, th- and so Paul has to write these corrective letters so that they will, will view these matters, not in rejection, but with a biblical worldview. To view all of these types of issues Christianly. Because here's the thing, my friends. We live the Christian life right here in this world. We pay taxes. We change diapers. We work jobs. We buy groceries. We make breakfast. We can't just all fly away. Now, how do you live as God's people in a pagan world, in a world that is ran by many unqualified, incompetent leaders? That's not a new question. Christians have had to deal with this for centuries. And here's the deal. The church continues to march on because there is no government where the gospel doesn't work. The gospel has worked in a monarchy, in a democracy, in a republic, in an oligarchy, in a dictatorship, and many other places. There are no closed countries to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's not nervous saying, what do we do about the Muslims? No, God is working salvation in the midst of the earth, right? The gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. And the gospel exploded. The church got started in a Greco-Roman world, which was a world ran by tyrants. And so let's, let's not fear and let's not freak out. Let's ask the basic question, how do we live as citizens of heaven, as citizens on earth? How do we live, we who are in Christ, in Raleigh? How do we live as the Romans were trying to discern as well? How do we live in Christ and live in Rome? That's the question before us. So i got three parts to this sermon on submitting to the government, which I'm sure will be an instant classic. Um, first of all, what? <laughs> Second is why. And third is how. So three basic questions. What, why, how? The what right here in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Every person, literally every soul. Paul's not talking about Christians and non-Christians. He's not making that kind of distinction. It's literally every human person. And he's not making a distinction between what types of leaders we have. Christian leaders or non-Christian leaders or good leaders or bad leaders. But every person is to be subject to the governing authorities. An authority represents the authority of the state, which is everything from a local bureaucrat all the way up to prime minister or president or emperor. Be subject to them. Or as some translations uh, say, submissive to them, which is the same word in Greek, and that's the idea. Submission involves an understanding that this is how God has ordered the world. And so let them be subject to those in authority. Now this is not an isolated reference. This is throughout the New Testament, Titus 3.1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. 1 Timothy 2, we're called to pray for those in authority. Most significantly, I think, for our text, this is the best cross-reference, is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, where Peter says, be subject, and this is an important phrase, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to, the, and to praise those who do good. Notice the emphasis on doing good as well. This is in Romans. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, if you're writing the Bible today, would you write that? (laughs) Well, you're not writing the Bible. (laughs) There are a lot of things we wouldn't write, right? Now, notice that little phrase, for the Lord's sake. We, we submit to the authorities and obey them, ultimately out of reverence to and submission for the Lord. And my friends, that's how submission works across the Bible. It's always unto the Lord. And we'll get into the exceptions in just a minute. But I just want you to see that this is, this is a way in which we honor the Lord. Government, at least by design, is here for our good, Romans says. It's an expression of God's sov- or, excuse me, common grace and his sovereign grace, but common grace. 
It is designed to provide justice, order, civility. It's like a gift of marriage or family. It's given to preserve and enrich humanity, to restrain evil. There are good designs behind government. Now, there are a few objections when people come to Romans 13. Let me mention two. The first one, I think, is that some argue that Paul's kind of sweeping, unqualified demand to submit to government somehow justifies the actions of evil people and demands obedience to them at all times. But I, you, don't, you, you should not come to that conclusion. We read Scripture with Scripture, do we not? And we know from Acts 5.29 that the New Testament is clearly showing us that it is better to obey God rather than men. We engage in civil disobedience when the gover government prohibits us from doing what the Lord commands or when it commands us to do what the Lord prohibits. Now, I think this is implicit in the very idea of submit. In the New Testament, uh, we're, we're taught about submitting to one another, children to parents, servants to masters, submitting to God's law, submitting in marriage, submitting to uh, uh, the church, submitting to Christ, submitting to God, and so on. But the, the parallel to marriage, I think, is very helpful. God has designed marriage in such a way that the man is to be the leader, the guide, the servant leader, the Jesus-like leader, and the wife is called to submit unto the Lord to that kind of husband. But that does not mean that she is to do whatever he demands. If a husband is leading a lady into sin or is abusing her, is not caring for her, then she should not submit to him. And in the same way, there are times in which we may not be able to submit to the governing authorities. How would Peter say, do it for the Lord's sake, if you're doing something that the Lord explicitly says not to do? Right? right? Submission is, it is, um, it is governed submission. Now, with that said, Paul's not dealing with the exceptions in Romans 13. We love to raise the questions when we come here. What if this? What about this? When is it okay to practice civil disobedience? And Christians have disagreed for years on that. And I'm not going to try to parse all of that out because that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's dealing with the basic idea of authority and order and the design of government. Now, the second objection is people say, Paul's naive, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he should have went to UNC, <laughs> right? He, he should stick to or propitiation and not politics. But Paul is drawing on personal history and redemptive history in making these statements. He knows what he's talking about. Paul had a mixed experience with Roman authorities. We went through the book of Acts just a few years ago as a church, and you can see how at times the Roman officials protected Paul, helped Paul. And when Paul preached the gospel to some of these leaders, he did so with a great sense of respect and thoughtfulness. At the same time, Paul's experience showed him that leaders could be unjust. In fact, Jesus was crucified by unjust leaders. And Paul had been afflicted and imprisoned unjustly many times. So he had a mixed experience. He knew, though he's writing, submit to governing authorities, he knew that they sometimes could operate unjustly. And Paul knew redemptive history. What does redemptive history teach us about this issue? Well, it teaches us, the Bible teaches us, that God is sovereign over the authorities. This is Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. And that's not an isolated reference. We see that throughout the Old Testament. Jesus told Pilate on one occasion, you would have no authority over me if it wasn't given to you from above. So Paul knows that God is sovereign over the authorities, and Paul's heritage also taught him that it was right at times to resist the governing authorities. Daniel is a book about it. Daniel chapter 3, the Hebrew boys do not bow down to an idol, resisting authority, and they are commended. Daniel himself did the same, did he not? Was thrown into a den of lions. In Exodus, you got these Hebrew midwives who are told to, uh, not, to kill the baby boys, and they're like, no. And those Hebrew women were vigorous, Exodus says. There's babies coming everywhere. And they are commended for protecting life. In Hebrews eleven twenty three, 23, it says that Moses' parents hid him because they were not afraid of the king's edict. There are clearly times to do that. Paul had both of these in mind. So when he comes to Romans 13, 
I think he knows what he's talking about. He knows that there are examples of, in the Old Testament, of civil disobedience. But again, that's not the point of Romans 13. He's talking in generalities about the design. And the main point of the what is that we are to be submissive to them, knowing everything that I've just said in doing that. Second question, why? And I've already alluded to the first one, that God has instituted the governing authorities. Verse 1b, he says, for there is no authority except from God. Next phrase is even clearer, isn't it? Those that exist have been instituted by God. So God is sovereign over the government. All authorities are instituted by the God who governs the world. Even in the book of Kings, which we also studied a few years back, we see that God is sovereign in, in those who are in leadership. Jeroboam was one of the most wicked kings in Israel. And this is what it says in 1 Kings 12, verse 15. When Jeroboam took the throne, it says, It was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord. Piper puts it well. He says, This means that the Roman Christians and we today should learn that it is God's will to govern the world of mankind through human civil authorities. This is God's plan. Man did not create the government. God did. Man does not sustain it. God does. Civil authority is God's idea in this age. But why are certain people in leadership? At times, to bless people. And at times, as judgment. And, if I could add a third reason, to bring trial, to sanctify us in affliction. What kind of day are we in? Well, I will not presume to answer that question. I don't know. What I know is that God reigns. Amen. And he's sovereign. And we shouldn't freak out about it. Many Christians today cannot see past human government to the government of God. Many conservative Christians especially lose their mind when it comes to politics. And their witness, I would add. They fail to see the God who is over the government. Engage in the process? Absolutely. Speak truth to power? Yes, when possible. But make an idol out of a party or a system? No way. Lose our minds? No. We can't live our lives in a horizontal way. We have to look vertically to the God who reigns and bow before his providence and realize as Christians he is working all things, including political leaders, somehow for our good and for his glory. We can't answer the deep mysteries of, of why, but we know God reigns. Now, because God is working out some of the purposes of God, we are told in verse 2 to reject authority is to bring judgment. He says, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. So God has appointed this, and whoever resists, whoever, who resists will incur judgment. I think this is a double judgment from earthly leaders and then eventual uh, judgment from God. So why submit to the authorities? First of all, God has instituted the authorities. Secondly, verses 3 and 4 show us that the authorities are God's servants, at least by design, to punish evil and reward good. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to, to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority and do what is good? And you will receive approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain for he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer now what Paul does here is he dignifies the office but he puts the leader under God notice he doesn't say that the a leader the official is God many of them think they are especially Nero as Paul's writing no they're God's servant he dignifies the office but puts this leader under God Many of them are unconsciously serving the purposes of God. And Paul describes here the purpose of their work, and that is to promote that which is good, to punish evildoers. And it says in verse 4 that they have the right to use force. They have punitive capacity under God. He is God's servant for your good. That's one of the ways we should be praying for our leaders, that they would promote that which leads to human flourishing. That's why they're there. And that's 1 Timothy 2. That's the prayer that Paul says we should pray for kings and all who are in high position that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. That is that they may promote good. 
Now, if believers want to be free from fear of the authorities, they should be people who do good. Again, this is the way it is supposed to work. And we are all aware in this room of horrific events where people have abused power and punished or killed innocent civilians. But when it comes to their purpose, according to Romans 13, both the citizens and the authorities are to serve the common good. Now often Christians can be just like the rest of the world and we can complain about the state of things and we don't spend a lot of time trying to bless our towns, our cities, and our nation. It's either easier to complain than to pray and to do that which is good, to bless the common good. I think Jeremiah's word to the Israelites living in Babylon is very appropriate for us today. Here are, here are the Israelites living in a pagan world in Babylon and this is what they are instructed to do. Jeremiah 29 verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent you into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. And notice verse 7, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Did you catch all that? Live in the city. Pray for the city. Do that which is good in the city. Promote the welfare of the city. Now that's how we must live in our Babylon. Again, it's much easier to complain than to pray for the welfare of certain individuals, is it not? We can't just be people who talk. It's right, I think, for us to speak out against abortion, but we must be ready to receive children. We can't just have a big mouth, we need big arms. It is right for you to be enraged at the state of things at a certain level, with Romans 12 in mind. But if all that leads to is a sense of murmuring and complaining and bitterness, then we're not following this model. We're taking up carnal weapons that have no success. Paul doesn't tell the Romans, go fight Nero. He says, go do good. My friend Harvey gave me a great example, I think, of a church that is um, trying to bless the city. That's kind of their tagline for their church, in the city, for the city. Harvey was preaching a sermon on sexuality. I thought I'd make my sermon a little bit more controversial. Um, And only one of seven had to do with the issue of homosexuality. And of course, that's the one that everybody showed up to, to hear. People got a hold of this sermon. There's a lady who's kind of on this crusade against churches. And um, following this sermon, uh, in like the next week or so, they were going to have this art walk in the city, something they do with multiple businesses. This is in Reno, by the way. Great place to start a church, Reno. Um, and... Um, This lady hears about this art walk. Well, she goes business to business to tell them, do you know what they teach at their church? Well, Harvey and his church have such a reputation in the city, the movement got no traction. In fact, he said there was a lady, she owned a tattoo shop, piercing shop. She's a bisexual. She came to Harvey and said, look, I know what you guys believe, and I know, and you know I disagree with you, but you've done too much in this city, too much good for our schools, for me to turn my back on you guys and she went business to business advocating for them and the whole thing was just shut down because I think they're doing that sort of Jeremiah 29 thing trying to promote the welfare of the city trying to bless the city there are going to be people who disagree with our doctrine but they should not disagree with our goodness that will provoke some no doubt to anger and hostility it won't always be winsome but that's what we're called to do He tells the Romans, do that which is good. Peter told that to his readers as well, did he not? Let's be a people like Jesus who go about doing good in our land. Verse 5 is a summary. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath. That's what's just been said because God has instituted the authorities, but also for the sake of conscience. That is, our moral compass tells us this is right. You see, the Christian has more of a reason to be obedient to the government. We don't just want to avoid punishment. We want to please God. And we get to do all of this, even pay taxes unto the Lord. That's the only way taxes can be fun, is if you know it's unto the Lord. So what, why, how? Two ways. 
First of all, we pay taxes. Amen? <laughs> and secondly, we honor leaders. Oh, this is so much fun. Verse 6. He says, for, because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God. Now he changes the word. He's already said that they're servants twice. Now ministers of God, different word he uses, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Reverence to whom, or excuse me, revenue to whom revenue is owed. Now, Paul is really just echoing Jesus, isn't he? When Jesus says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Jesus legitimized government, give it to Caesar. But he also put it in its proper place. Give to God what is God's. Give your coin to Caesar, it has his image on it. Give your life to God, you bear his image. Amen. Don't lose your witness over taxes. Pay the tax, give the coin, give your life to God. Honoring leaders, honor to whom, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Do you find this hard? Probably not for many leaders. I know many honorable leaders, don't you? And they're worthy of great honor. And then I see certain things <laughs> I don't like Romans 13, verse 7 very much. Paul clearly has governing authorities in mind here. So what do we do? Well, we must obey it. Some of you need to run for office. Get more involved. And all of us must live honorably. I find it a challenge, my friends. I'm sickened. I'm just speaking candidly by the state of American politics find it shameful and embarrassing and it grieves me but we must respect the office even when we disagree and dislike those in office when Paul was speaking to Agrippa he did so with great respect and he preached the gospel to him Paul's teaching the Romans here be a good citizen respect those in leadership not because the world esteems them or because you like their policies they didn't like Nero's policies they didn't like his taxes but because in some way they're fulfilling God's design and that leads me to my applications now I just have a few of them not five this, this is a summary these aren't new ideas I'm just bringing it all together here first of all let me encourage you to acknowledge God's design for civil authorities and to thank God for all the good that is done through them and my friends, as bad as we see things to be today, there are a lot of really good, honorable leaders, and we should give God thanks for all the good that they do. Can you imagine if 911 never answered? If we had zero police, no military, just gangs. Abuse and violence would be everywhere. Consider this, my friends, about 4 billion, IJM says, about 4 billion of the world's poor live outside the rule of law. Poverty, trafficking, all these things we're fighting largely is pointed to the fact there is no rule of law. There's no restraint. And so when we see leaders promoting good, doing their job well, let us give God thanks for them. And let us thank them. Secondly, let's pray for those in leadership. If you find this text difficult in our current day, if you find this idea of honor, difficult admonition, then let's take that as a call to prayer. One of the ways you can honor those in leadership is by praying for them. And by the way, that's the, that's the real power, isn't it? We read in Proverbs that God can change the heart of a king. And so let us, let us pray to the God who changes people. He's changed us, right? Let's pray for those in leadership. God grant them wisdom. They would promote that which is good. Thirdly, this text is telling us to be a good citizen. Pay taxes, obey the law, including the speed limit, Nate. Be respectful. And remember, you do all of that unto the Lord. Isn't that great? Like all of life is worship, even to the mundane things of paying taxes. 
live with a clear conscience before God, serve the city and your town for the common good, engage in the political process, bring your convictions to the public arena. I love Proverbs 14, righteousness exalts a nation. That's what makes a nation great, righteousness. Fourth, let's rest in the providence of God. Calm down, God is in control. Sometimes people talk about the White House as if the church will collapse if somebody gets in there. I love what Mark Dever says. Our nation is an experiment. The church is a certainty. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is growing around the world in places of oppressive governments. So let's trust God. Our testimony of the world is our God reigns. Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. Yeah, the, the, Lord, the Lord reigns. And we grieve, struggle, we agonize in these days, but we know our God reigns. And God is sanctifying us. Sanctification is not always pleasant. Fifth, make your ultimate allegiance to King Jesus. I love what Dr. Aiken says, as a devoted follower of Jesus, I will say yes to obeying government and paying taxes to Caesar, but I will say no to disobeying the word of God and worshiping a man or institution. Independence Day for the Christian is not marked by a flag. No, our Independence Day is Easter, marked by a cross and an empty tomb. My friends, one day soon, Jesus is going to establish a one-party kingdom. And he will rule with perfect peace and justice forever. And the lion and the lamb will play together. Paul was clearly aware that soon Jesus' kingdom would overtake the mighty Roman Empire. Nero would put Paul to death. But today people name their dogs after Nero and their sons after Paul. Kings and kingdoms fade away. But the kingdom of Christ endures forever. And while we're here, we're called to be exemplary citizens and make our ultimate allegiance to King Jesus. Now, my friend, maybe you're a great citizen, but you're not a citizen of heaven. I would say to you, you haven't acknowledged the greatest authority, which is Jesus' authority. And that would be a tragedy, would it not? Recently, we were having some uh, dinner with some folks at IDC. They just became... American citizens, as many, many are in the process of doing. And we entered their house, and on the chalkboard it said to one of the kids, congratulations on becoming an American citizen. My friends, I love being an American citizen. When I travel overseas and come home, I want to kiss the earth. But there is no security and no identity like being a citizen of heaven. And here's the good news. You don't have to go through a rigorous process to become a citizen of heaven. All you need is need. You need to recognize you're a broken sinner and that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree to make us righteous. The king who has all authority invites you into his kingdom. The king who is perfectly trustworthy. The king who has never uttered a false word. A king who doesn't shame people, but dies for people. That king invites us in. Every week we get here and we take this Lord's table we're about to take. We're reminded of the king we belong to. Paul writes this in Philippians 3. I'll finish. Why don't you read this aloud with me, this great reminder of where our citizenship is. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Amen. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We long for him to come and set up his unending, perfectly ruled kingdom. Let us give honor to whom honor is due, and my friend, honor is due him. Perfect honor and all glory is due our king. And let's be his happy servants until we see him and we experience this new heaven and new earth. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray you would sanctify us through it. Make us good citizens. Make us people who pray, who promote the welfare of our land. 
Make us honorable people. May we do all of it unto the King. All of it unto the Lord Jesus, our great King. As we approach the table now, we're reminded of what leadership looks like. Leadership looks like laying down our lives for the good of others. And the Lord Jesus has died the ultimate death that we may be part of this unending kingdom. Increase our gratitude for the King, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.